thanks to everyone for joining us today. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whatever the case may be. Today we're going to talk about best practices for obtaining RNA sequencing data from formalin fixed paraffin embedded samples. Um, I would like to tell you just a little bit about uh, EA, but first let me give you an outline of today's webinar. I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenges and opportunities that we face with FFPE samples, how we work with FFPE samples, and what our particular solutions-based approaches are. Then I'm going to talk some about comparing different methods for RNA sequencing and why certain methods are more suitable than others. Finally, I'm going to tell you some about a relatively new method called the TrueSeq RNA Access Method, which was developed recently by Illumina and that we obtained early access to. We've done some preliminary testing of this method, and we find it to be very exciting, and I'd like to share that with you today. Then finally, I'll wrap up with a few concluding remarks. So we have a lot to cover today, so let me tell you a little bit about EA to begin with. As Andrew mentioned, we've been in business for almost 14 years now, starting as an Affymetric Gene Expression Services provider. Uh, since this webinar is being recorded, I will dispense with the majority of this slide, but I would like to tell you um, that uh, what I'm going to emphasize today is the RNA sequencing services that we started in 2011. And of course, uh, on this slide, I also have in, in yellow here, 2012, that was when we were acquired by uh, Quintiles, which has turned out to be a very uh, uh, interesting and fruitful acquisition for both parties. I think the thing that I'm most proud of in this slide is uh, down in the bottom right-hand corner, and that is we have an 85% annual client retention rate. So once our clients begin working with us, they tend to stick with us for the long haul. And that's something uh, that we built our organization for and something we're very proud of. So. Let's begin by talking about different challenges and opportunities with FFPE samples. So one of the challenges, and, and here I would like to draw your attention to the lower left-hand corner of my slide. Um, I've taken this figure um, uh, courtesy of Illumina. It came from a poster that they presented at AACR. Um, there are other attributions uh, that you will see throughout the presentation in the lower left-hand corner. So FFPE samples, of course, are very difficult to work with. I have to admit that I have sort of a love-hate relationship with them. The, the hate part is all of the sectioning, scraping, paraffin renewal, removal, macro dissection, even things like laser capture mic micro dissection that you need to do with these samples in order to be able to work with them. The RNA or the DNA, for that matter, can be very difficult to extract uh, from uh, this type of material. And it's degraded. The integrity levels vary, as you can see up above. And RIN values, which stands for RNA integrity number, um, that is a measurement taken by an analytical device, the Agilent Bioanalyzer, to measure the quality of RNA. Uh, they're just not very informative. Uh, if you look up at the panel up above, you can see that certain of the samples have RIN values of, say, 2.9, 2.6. There's another one that has a RIN value of 2.4. And you can see that there's actually a fairly large difference in the integrity of the samples if you look at their traces. However, uh, they have very similar RIN values, so it's, it's simply not very informative to us at, at that point. Now, formalin fixation uh, is cross-linking of the samples, and that can lead to non-functional RNA and DNA. And what I mean by that is that you really can't do much with it from a molecular biology standpoint. It's kind of dead to the assay. And so the amount of that dead or non-functional RNA and DNA can really differ from one sample to another, really depending upon uh, the exact conditions of the fixation. We also know that fixation and processing can introduce certain base changes, which is particularly problematic when you're trying to find variants in these samples. You have to be very careful about how you interpret certain of that data. So the extracted RNA and DNA can be very highly variable in size distribution and the percent of functional RNA and DNA. So that's the bad news. Why do I have the love relationship with FFP samples? Well, it's because of all the opportunities. And very simply stated, a colleague of mine put it this way, the tissue is the issue. For every experiment that you want to do, particularly in human populations, getting at that tissue that's going to inform the biology of the experiment that, you're, uh, that you have underway is so critical. So being able to access what is literally hundreds of thousands, actually 
really millions of different tissue samples that are awaiting analysis is really critical to us. The, the majority of these samples have very rich annotation. A large fraction of them have clinical outcome data associated with them. So they really are a treasure trove of samples that we can access if only we have the right methods. There's a huge breadth of different tissue types from very diverse populations. These types of samples are, are collected really routinely around the world. Now, one thing that I do want to mention is there are, of course, other tissue collection and fixation methods that are out there, some of which avoid some of the problems that I'm going to tell you about today. However, FFB really remains a standard. That's what most laboratories do. Uh, most pathology services will, will formal and fix their samples. And because we have these millions of samples around the world that we'd like to be able to access, we really do need solutions for FFPE samples, even if new methods for tissue collection and fixation are being introduced.